Welcome to the PA Books podcast. PA Books is a production of PCN, the Pennsylvania Cable Network. This program features interviews with authors of books on Pennsylvania people, history, sports, business, nature, and politics. While the focus is always on Pennsylvania, topics like the Revolutionary War, the Battle of Gettysburg, the Industrial Revolution, the coal and steel industries, and authors like John Updike, David McCullough, and John Grogan have a universal appeal. We hope you enjoy this podcast. This week on PA Books, Tom McMillan, the author of Flight 93. Tom McMillan, author of Flight 93. Why did you write this book so many years after the actual event? Well, uh, Brian, I actually wanted to read the book. I, I, I've been, it was so wrapped up in what happened on September 11th, and especially this story, so close to my home in Pittsburgh, was out there a lot, and I wanted to read more about it, and kind of it was frustrating to find out how little was written, not just about Flight 93, but the entirety of September 11th. That, I mean, I guess that's because a lot of people think it's too close, but I, I just thought it was a very important part of history and that it was important to try to do it while some of the core family members were still around. If you wait 50 years, you know, the people who got the calls can't be interviewed. So I just thought it was, a, it was an appropriate time. I just thought I would give it a shot. How many people did you talk to for this book? I probably, well, I mean, uh, uh, more than 50 overall. I talked to pro I talked to probably directly eight uh, family members, but the Flight 93 National Memorial has also done oral histories with family members, first responders, firemen, anybody really affected with that day. And while they're public, almost no one has seen them. So that, especially that, that was one of the things that motivated me that this book could be done, that so much of that material had already been created and 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 cataloged, but but no one had seen it. Almost as, as someone who loves history, it's. It's laying there, it's there, but, but someone has to know. And you obviously, you can't read all 700 oral histories, but work with the people out there and try to pick ones that, that, that seemed appropriate. Um, so uh, there's, you know, there's, there's really a lot to the story. When you were working on this, uh, reading the stories and, and the transcripts, did you at some point think, why am I putting myself through this? Oh yeah, oh, yeah. It, it's, it was, uh, it's extremely emotional. Um, you go through all of that. And it's, it's also, you feel the weight of history. Um, you know, my job is not writing books, especially ab about history, and you, you sometimes feel uh, humbled or, or overwhelmed. There were several times I was going to throw my laptop into the river saying, you know, you, you just can't do this. You get frustrated. And then I thought, but if you, no one's done it. If you don't do it, no one's going to do it. The story has to be told. So that was, that was kind of the motivation. You have, to, you have to fight through that. And, you know, you're interviewing people who are crying on the phone. You're interviewing people in person who are crying, and not just family members, other people, you know, people who were affected. You talked to first responders who were there that day, who were, who were in, in the Shanksville area on September 11th. Uh, they live with that forever. So you kind of have to steel yourself through that. But you want to tell the story on, on their behalf. Their story deserves to be told, too. A lot of this is, is not just, uh, I really wanted to make sure it wasn't just what happened on the plane. And I know that one of the reactions I got from people, they were surprised that the two chapters on the plane were in the middle of the book. Like, it, it doesn't it doesn't end with the flight, which, which was my, my goal was to do it from the, the, the time the plot was hatched by Al-Qaeda in the middle 1990s through the opening of the National Memorial, or the Flight 93 National Memorial uh, in 2011 on the, on the 10 year anniversary. So it covers about a 15 year time span. How much did you have to learn about Al-Qaeda that kind of laid the groundwork for it? A, a lot, I thought it was essential. And I knew there would be some criticism of that, and, 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 and there was, you know, uh, that you humanized the, the hijackers. But my point, I tried, I tried to look at it coldly as a historian there. If I might call myself as such, I certainly am an amateur historian. Um, but that's part of the story. And part of the fascination to me was trying to find out a little bit of how uh, humanized them. They were human beings. Uh, what would make someone do this? And I think you can't, the other part was that I would try to, ex to explain to people who, who thought I'd done too much on that was you can't really appreciate what those people on board did until you learn how long and meticulously Al-Qaeda planned to pull this off. Um, you know, they, they planned for years and, and these folks had maybe 30 minutes 
to decide what, what, what they were going to do. So that's very much a, a part of the story. And it was a fascinating part of the story to me, how it happened. It, and it also, talk about emotions, you get really, you get really mad that this, this has happened and that it was allowed to happen. That some of them, they, were, they so brazenly lived openly in our society, they didn't even try to use pseudonyms or fake names. Uh, they, you know, they, they bought their plane tickets under their own names. There was no attempt to conceal this. There, the, there was an arrogance there that they knew they weren't going to get caught. And as, as an American, you, 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 you're, you're fist ball up. So there were all sorts of emotions, not just the ones you would normally anticipate. Uh, there, were, there, were, there were highs and lows and, uh, and some sleepless nights of doing this, I can tell you that. Why did the plot take years to unfold? I think from learning it with, with Bin Laden's Al-Qaeda, they were amazingly patient. And they would wait and they would plan for years and they would wait for the right moment. And as with anything, you know, from this is from their perspective, you need luck. And I mean, they, they started talking about this in 1996. It wasn't pulled off until 2001. Um, another amazing thing is how the, the, a plot could have been in the works, and it, it was it was very just conceptual in 1996. But nonetheless, it had been discussed. Um, the, the, the first uh, plot proposed to Bin Laden was to hijack ten planes and do it on both coasts. So, and he thought eventually that that was too complicated, so they wanted to cut it down to four and just make it on. On, on the East Coast. He was uh, very wily in his planning. So some of it is that too. And then part of it is, is finding the people who would do this. Um, you still have to have martyrs. Uh, they definitely miscalculated. They thought that it was easier to f learn to fly planes than it, than it was. Uh, some of the testimony you would see for some of the folks who were in, the, the plotters who were in Guantanamo was they thought it was like driving a car. And uh, the first two men they sent over here uh, ended up being uh, muscle hijackers but they were simply incapable of learning how to fly planes. They basically couldn't speak English. And, uh, and it, was, it was a joke at the flight school. Uh, but they found uh, four uh, young men had gone to a training camp in, in Afghanistan in the late uh, 1990s who were living in Germany and were college students in Germany. So they had lived in a Western society. They could speak English and they could assimilate much easier into our society. So all those things had to, had to fall in place. So they, they, it, it, is, it has always been a very patient group, and they, uh, they kind of outweighed and outlast you. So it was possible for them to just get on a plane and fly to the U.S. and go through customs and then sign up for a flight school? Yes, And, and yes. learn how to play, fly yes. commercial planes? Yes. Uh, well, they learned, to fly, uh, they learned to fly small planes. They never were going to ever fly commercial planes. The, but, but to answer your first question, yes, uh, they flew under their own names. They, had, uh, they just got their passports and, and, and flew. Uh, the three of the pilots were here for more than, more than a year, uh, living and training in Florida, going to flight schools there in Venice, Florida. Uh, they, they got their, their single engine and their, and their double engine licenses. And they knew they weren't going to be able to go beyond that actual training. But then they signed up at flight schools to fly on simulators of 757s and 767s because they knew that they weren't going to have to take off and land. All they had to do was steer the plane when it was, when it was in the air. So by practicing on these simulators, and there were the 9-11 Commission and got some experts and interviewed them, would this be possible? Yes, if you didn't have to land the plane, if you just had to steer it, you would be able to do it. And that's, uh, that, that's what they were able to do. And none of this raised suspicion? There were... Um, there are a lot of foreign students, as I found, at these flight schools. Uh, the one uh, flight school where, where one of the, uh, where the Flight 93 uh, hijacker pilot actually learned to fly, I estimated 30% uh, foreign students. A lot of those uh, Arabs, they would come over here because these were the best flight schools, and they would get licenses. And many, you know, outstanding citizens with, with good intentions would come here, learn to fly, and go back to their countries and, and become airline pilots. So that alone did not, did not raise any suspicions. Um, they had, you know, Al-Qaeda knew how to clean their passports, even though these guys had been at training camps. Uh, they were, they, these, these folks were not on any watch list. The, the, the first two muscle hijackers who came in, the CIA and FBI definitely missed, missed opportunities. They, they were on watch lists. They got into the country. They ended up being muscle hijackers on uh, the flight that they hit the Pentagon, but, uh, but none, of the, none of the pilots. What's a muscle hijacker? There were, sorry to use that phrase. The, uh, the plan was uh, for hijack team, each hijack team was supposed to have five men. There were only four on flight 93. We can go into that a little bit later. There will be one pilot, one 
pilot, hijacker pilot, who would take one, and four muscle, who would, uh, uh, two of them would be seated very close to the po cockpit, and they would attack the pilots, take out the pilots. The other two would control the passengers and the rest of the crew, force them to the back of the plane. That was the plan. Uh, we only know, of course, we don't know exactly what happened on the planes, but, but two of the main plotters are in Guantanamo, and their stories have been consistent, and that, that was the plan. So there were two to attack the cockpit, two to force them back. Uh, the FBI and other investigators started calling them muscle hijackers, and that makes sense to us, but it gives you this image. One of the things that I, that I found that kind of shocked me, it gives the image of these big muscular guys, and, and, and they were not. Uh, they were between five feet five and five feet seven inches tall. They were skinny. Um, they were not these big athletic people we would think of as football linebackers. They just knew they, what, what Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda always knew would have the element of surprise. This could not happen again. People would react, but they knew they would have the element of surprise. And, uh, and they just needed more of that passion to die, the passion to become suicidal and, and, and do this and make that commitment. So they just believed that that's what they had. So there were 19 hijackers and how many people all together knew about this? Did the uh, 19 hijackers know each other? I mean, who all knew that this was happening, yeah, that they and, were able to keep it And quiet? again, there was, the one thing, there were supposed to be 20, so one, they were not able to get the 20th hijacker in. They tried several times to get different people in, so the Flight 93 crew was, was smaller, only had, had a pilot in, and, and, and three muscle hijackers, which might have been part of the reason why the, why the passengers and crew were able to, uh, to overtake them. But they did, certainly the, the four pilots knew what was going on. The muscle, high, the muscle men, so to speak, uh, the hit teams of 15 men, they knew they were coming to America. They arrived between April and June of 2001 with the attack in September. They knew they were coming to America to take part in a suicide operation. They didn't know exactly what it was until it got, until they got here. Too. To camouflage things, Al-Qaeda had trained them in Afghanistan not just to hijack planes, but also to hijack trucks to do some bombing missions so that if they were ever caught, they would not be able to divulge the exact plan. So they didn't know until they got here. But obviously, in, the, in those months over the summer, they would have to train and plot among themselves as to, as to how they would, they would do this. And it, it, it still is amazing to me that it, that it worked on all four planes. But obviously, the, the Flight 93 passengers and crew prevented uh, with their actions, this plane from, from, from hitting uh, uh, the, the Capitol building. So it wasn't successful in that sense. But they did, were able to take over four planes, which my, I think that had to surprise even them. I think even the Al Qaeda hier hierarchy back in Afghanistan must have been surprised that, that all, four were, all four hijackings were successful. Hey, you write about uh, one of the hijackers, Zacharias Musawi. His arrival struck the well, flight school instructors are suspicious. The new student didn't even have a private pilot's license, and he suddenly wanted to learn to fly large commercial airplanes. Masawi had overstayed his visit. On August 17th, he was de detained by the Immigration and Naturalization Service and arrested on immigration charges. Local FBI agents were unable to get permission from headquarters to search his laptop before September 11th. When you were doing all your research, did you find multiple points along the way where the good guys blew it? There, there were some. Now, Masawi's interesting because he was not actually one of the 19 hijackers. He, uh, his role is modeled. He was definitely here training. Um, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who was the operational mastermind in Guantanamo, insists that he was part of a second wave. There was going to be a second wave of attacks months later. Uh, it, it's, it seems to uh, some of the investigators from the 9-11 Commission, and, and I, I tend to buy this, that the, the hijacker pilot of uh, Flight 93, Zia Jarrah, was wavering at the end. It seems to me that Masawi was over here uh, training very quickly as a backup in case Jarrah backed out. So I think that's why it's so close. That was maybe the biggest missed opportunity because he was, there was suspicion. He was tra uh, training at a flight school in, in Minnesota. He showed up and didn't have a, 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 even a small, air, small plane license and wanted to fly big jets uh, and paid in cash. Um, they did detain him on immigration charges, but they, as, as I wrote, they weren't able to get permission to look at his laptop. Had they done that, um, they would have found some connections. They probably couldn't have unraveled the plot, but that knowledge, I think, would have kept bin Laden and his lieutenants from moving forward. The other thing is if we'd announced that we had arrested him, I think, in retrospect, that probably would have, September 11th tax probably would have happened at some time. They probably wouldn't have happened on September 11th. Because um, I think that would have spooked them a little bit. But, uh, you know, as you try to, 
uh, look at this, law enforcement does that for a reason. They, they, they want to keep it quiet so that perhaps they could follow some of those connections. It was just too close. He was arrested in August and uh, they weren't able to connect the dots uh, before September 11th. I think, you know, you look back and, and, and some of the things that, that have happened since then, you always, uh, we always have to look at, at missed clues, things that, that were missed. Um, there were certainly signs, um, mistakes that were made, but there certainly wasn't. I, I, I looked at this as much as I could. No one could say we knew they were going to hijack four planes and crash them into buildings in early September. There wasn't, you couldn't put that much together. So they, they, there should have been more focus on a threat. I think absolutely there was, a, there was a mistake there, but I don't know that they could have ever figured out exactly what, what, what was going to go on. When you were researching this, did, did you do much reading into the philosophy of Al-Qaeda or like what, what motivates them? Yeah, some. And, and, and why, um, has that changed over the years? The, the, the things that, that bin Laden would, would say, and a lot of it was, you know, first was just to eject the Americans from the Holy Land, you know, following the Gulf War, that there were American troops uh, there and needed a cause, and then he wanted to take the fight to America. Um, the, the more amazing, I, I, under, I, I think I understood that a little bit. I, the, the more amazing thing was, was how you could, in my mind, brainwash these young people to commit suicide attacks. I just, it, it, it's, it's hard for us to fathom, you, you know, somebody doing that, that you, that you would willingly come here and, uh, and, and even live here. Um, I, I think one of, my big, one of the big questions you have is some of these people were here for a year with, uh, with you know, the lifestyle here in the, in the United States um, and that you would still want to commit, uh, commit such an act. So um, it, it's, I, under, I tried to understand it. I tried to learn as much as I could, but I don't think anyone uh, in our society could ever under, totally understand why they did what they did. It's, it's, it's part of the, of the fascination of this story, though, is how, again, the, you know, the, the humanizing the hijackers, trying to find out who they were and why they did what they did. I'm not saying that I, that I found out why they did, but you at least explore their backgrounds a little bit and, and explain that to me. Because I think that's one thing that, that most people uh, who have followed the September 11th story have, have not done. They've, they've not looked at that. One of the things that, that, that I do think here, uh, people have asked me, uh, you know, what did you find out that was new? And, and I find from people's reaction to the book, and I thought this was true, that most people don't know much at all about what happened on September 11th. And I think that there's a natural reason for that. I think most people paid, consumed all the media for about a week to about September 17th, maybe September 20th when President Bush gave that big speech. And then we had to move on with the rest of our lives. Well, so most of what most people know, even I talked to them today, is what was reported in those, for those first seven to 10 days. And a lot of that was wrong. It's not that the media did a bad job. I think in, in any crisis, calamitous situation, that's what happens. There's misinformation that, that, that gets out there. And it's corrected and more information comes out in weeks and months and years after that. But most people aren't following it. So I had so many people say, reading through this story, I didn't know this, I didn't know this. Because a, a lot of those misconceptions that, that came out you know, the, the first week, that, that the hijackers used box cutters, that the calls came from cell phones, that, that Todd Beamer was the singular leader of the Flight 93 uh, uprising, which I hear all the time. And, and, he, and Beamer very much was a hero, but he certainly wasn't the only guy, and I don't believe he was the leader. Uh, but those things stick in people's minds. So I, I, think, How, that, that was part of the, I, I think that's part of the satisfaction of me writing the book to try to get some of those details out there. How often did you come across a story or a fact or something that caused you to say, well, son of a gun, didn't know that? Yeah, oh, a lot. Because I was one of those people at the beginning. I thought, I was, when I, when I read, what do you mean? I, you, you, you could take knives of less than four inches onto planes back then legally? Well, I didn't know that. I think most Americans did that. Hijackers knew that. They, uh, they researched our airline security uh, magnificently from their standpoint. It was, it was, you know, they, they found every little loophole. They found every little opening. They exploited any little weakness that we had. Most Americans would not have known you could take knife, knives on board. And they knew that. And, and then if you go back, uh, the Masao, we talked about Zacharias Masao. He, he was on trial in 2006. And all of that trial evidence is online. Uh, again, it's very public. Almost no one's read it. I tried to read as much of it as, as I could. It's kind of astonishing. And there were receipts of these guys going to Lowe's and Home Depot and stores like that and, and buying these, you know, multi-purpose 
tools with seven or eight little knives, gadgets, gadgets that, that, that people have in their garages all the time, and they, carry the, they were able to legally carry these onto planes. And you just, you, say, uh, you know, how, how, how could this have happened? And, I, you know, I wondered about uh, phone calls. That was the first thing, because the media just immediately heard about phone calls. And there were calls made from all four of the flights. You hear more of them of, of Flight 93, where there were, there were 37 made. But I think the media just assumed, well, they came from cell phones. And, and then that started some of the conspiracy theories. Well, how could you make a cell phone call from 35,000 feet, which you pretty much can't. Um, but they were made from air phones that were on the back. People who traveled in the late 1990s, early 2000s would remember them. They were seat backs phone, phones, one for every three seat, seats you could pull it out, run your credit card through it, and make a call from 35,000 feet. It was just kind of a, a perk of aviation, I would call it. Or, or maybe, hey, my plane was, uh, was an hour uh, late. I'll be late for my meeting. Um, they were able to, to make those calls. There, there were 37 calls made from Flight 93. 35 of them were from air phones. Only, only two were from cell phones, and they were very late. But, but most people, I volunteer out at the memorial, most people come out and, and want to talk about this, the, you know, the, the cell phone calls. So because of that, the FBI had a record of the calls, that, the numbers that, that were reached, the length of the calls, and where they were made on the plane. So I was able to kind of lay out all this. I in, went to the office on weekends and laid stuff out over the, uh, all over the floors, and you could find out where these people were sitting as they made the calls, as they, you know, all the passengers who were pushed to the back of the plane. So you could see who was sitting next to who, and, and uh, I, I found that. I found that fascinating. So all of that was that was an aha moment all the way. Wow, it wasn't cell phones, it was air phones. Wow, they know where, where they call from. They know who they called. They know how many calls they made. They know how long the calls lasted. Uh, and and all, I, you know, I tried to uh, go sequentially through that in, in, the, in the two chapters on the flight to try to paint a picture of, again, we can, no one can ever know anything. We will never know. Everyone on the plane, everyone who knows what happened is, is not with us. But I think it's the closest we can come sequentially to, to what might have happened. So, yes, there were a lot of those moments. Are there any transcripts of the phone calls? Oh, yes. Yeah, transcripts of the phone calls. And, uh, Does it make tough reading? Uh, yes. Yes, uh, at the uh, the new visitor center, which which uh, opened in, uh, in 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 2015, out in at the Flight 93 National Memorial, there actually are three recordings because three people called. Um, you know, back then we didn't we didn't have uh, smartphones, so we all had answering machines, and three of them uh, left messages on answering machines, and and the families approved this. But you can uh, you know it's, it's your choice. Some people you know can't hear them, but if you want to, you can you can listen to these these messages that were left from these horrified people in midair and and all three of them they are much more concerned about their loved ones on the ground than they are about and how you're going to react to this and I feel so bad I won't be able to see you. it's very uh, it, it, it's, it's very moving but yes there are transcripts of those calls and and then there's a there's a transcript of the of the cockpit voice recorder uh, that recording does exist other than the, the families, only the Masawi trial jury has heard it. So mm. I didn't, most people have not heard it, but there are very detailed transcripts of that. So again, it's, uh, it, it's hard reading, but if you're going to do a book like this, you have to kind of fight through it and, and, uh, and, and, and have the motivation to get the story out and just put your emotions behind you a little bit. But I, I just, I, I, I can't imagine what what went on in, in that cockpit. And even now looking, I, I can read my own book, uh, you know, years after writing it and get emotional when I read parts of it. What was the security like getting on a plane? And would you have to, what was the process of having to go through security? I mean, it's different now, but. Then. Yeah, it's, right. It, 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 certainly we, we had it, but I, I think, and this is one of the criticisms. I, I think people say it should have been tougher. Um, Imagine before September 11th if they told us all the regular passengers we had to take off our shoes. No, I mean, the American society simply would not have accepted that. It's just, you know, we, we wanted those kinds of freedoms. We were confident in our freedoms. It had gone well for so long. So were there restrictions in place? Certainly. Were you, were you scanned? Sure. But uh, there, there clearly wasn't enough. Um, and it, and in these, but they did study our systems, so they knew how to, they knew what they could get through. They went on, at least six of them, their, their tickets that had, uh, records of tickets exist, at least six of them went on casing flights that summer. On the types of planes they would have flown, in first class, going east coast to west coast, 
So I'm sure not only seeing what they could get on the plane, can I get a knife on, can I get a box cutter on? Because they, they, they did use box cutters, but, but predominantly knives. It's just the box cutter myth is out there. And people say, how do they pull this off with, with box cutters? Well, they had knives. But also, I think, observing the patterns of the, of the pilots and the crew, maybe when, the, when the, the door opened to the cockpit, if at all, when they started serving meals. Uh, they really got the rhythms down of a, of a flight. And, and they, it was, for them, a military operation. And again, to me, that, that makes it all the more amazing of what the passengers and crew did, because they were just people on a Tuesday morning flying to the West Coast. They had no idea that when you got on that plane that it was, it was, it was a plane that, that would literally go down in history. The hijackers did, and, and that, you know, that knowledge is, is it's why they didn't need the big muscular guys. That knowledge was their advantage. You mentioned that the, this is not your usual job. What is your usual job? I'm a... Uh, Vice President of Communications for the Pittsburgh Penguins hockey team. I've worked, I uh, was a sports writer before that, so I've been media and communications um, all my life, all my career. Uh, I do think uh, one of the motivations for this book, I'm an amateur historian, but one of the motivations of this book was I think those of us who work in sports um, do feel a little guilty sometimes that we don't do something more important, that maybe I could take my skills and done something more important. Now I realized that it's big entertainment, and, and there's, there's, there's importance to that. There, there is. People, have, uh, people very much need it. So I don't really feel that way totally. I don't, I don't, I don't feel guilty about my job. But I think there, there are pangs of guilt, and I thought I wanted to do uh, something more important. So this, uh, this, this checked the box. I did know, though, that there would be skepticism. Uh, I, you know, it, it, my, my book company, the, uh, the agent takes it to an editor, and the editor wants to sell the book uh, idea to his publishing board. And the publishing board did say, we, we like this book idea. We'd feel a little more comfortable if this guy was from the New York Times or the Washington Post was a reporter. And my editor said, well, they've had 10 years. They're not doing it. Let's just get this give guy a shot. So I had a little chip on my shoulder also to show that I, that I, that I could do it, that I wasn't just, a, wasn't just a sports guy. I did have a journalism background. But it, it was a daunting, daunting task. And it's humbling even to see uh, the book with you know, with my name on it years later. It's, it's almost like a, it was, a, it was a, a parallel life that was going on. But I, I, I do think that um, in sports, as a sports writer, as a commentator, you, you do learn to, to tell stories. I, I, I read some, uh, a, a debate in the, on both the Warren Commission and the 9-11 Commission. There were debates on how to write those reports. And because and uh, you can make them very legalistic, very lawyerly. And someone said, history is best written as a narrative. That's why people are interested. You can just throw fact after fact after, string together facts and, and make it very clinical and bore people to tears, except people, a small group of people who are really, really interested in this topic. My goal was to satisfy the people who were very much into it and had a lot of knowledge, maybe, maybe pull things, some things together for them, or place like but also be able to write it for, for the family that just goes to the Flight 93 National Memorial once and, and, and then gets an interest to write about that. You, you want it so that they can read it too. So I really tried to make it in there. I, I do think my sports writing background, readers only can judge this, I can't, but I do think that, you know, that, that might have helped. Is this your first book? I've done some books on sports, but those are like doing high school book reports compared to doing this. So this is my first book. Yeah, this is my first seri serious book. I, I'd, uh, I have the itch. I'd like to do another one on history. But you really have to, because um, I was doing this while I was working full time, um, you, I couldn't just get a book assignment for somebody to do it. I would have to have the passion. You, it, it, wasn't, I, it wasn't work. Even though I would get frustrated and emotional, it, it wasn't work. Yeah, there, was, there was a passion, uh, uh, a labor of love to doing this. I, I would need to have that kind of love for the topic to do it while I was also uh, working. You know, people said, you know, how do you do it? Well, we all have free time. I, I used my free time uh, to do this for two years. What does your job involve with the Penguins? Uh, it, it deals with, we deal with the media. Um, uh, interactions between the players, coaches, management, ownership, uh, and the media, and you know that job has really changed a lot with uh, with social media. From the time I took it over in 1996, it's a completely different job. I do some teaching at colleges in Pittsburgh, and and you say that all the time. But you you now become your own. We're now our own media operation as well. We can tell our own stories. You do. You know, when I first took this job, you couldn't do that. You were totally in PR company. You were totally reliant on the media to get your story out there. Well, now you still are. It's a very important part of it. But you can tell your own story as well. 
with uh, beginning with the website, obviously. That's so you write articles that go straight on the website? Our staff does. Yeah, we have, we have staff that does it, but even more important now with social media. You can just get to people uh, directly with your news. Before, if we made a trade, we had to write a press release, send it to media outlets, and hope they would report it. Now we can hit a button and send it to 700,000 Twitter followers instantaneously. So it, it, it really has, uh, has changed that for, you, for, you, for young people in business. It, it ties into the story of this book, though, Brian. The one thing that we get um, uh, as we speak now, it's been, it's been 14 years. There are young people who uh, either weren't alive or don't have any memory, we're sorry, you don't have any memory, who don't understand why there aren't more cell phone photos and why or weren't any tweets or anything. It, it was really the last major event that happened before the explosion of that kind of social media, before everyone had a smartphone. Imagine how we would remember September 11th differently if everyone had cameras in their stuff. You tell people, you, you, junior high, middle school children look at you and say, we didn't have cameras in our cell phones, and they can't imagine a time that that existed. That story would have been so different. There are so few photos that, I mean, none of the first responders took photos. Now imagine how many people have taken photos at all three of those sites. And, and it would have been, uh, for good and bad, I think there would have been a lot of misinformation that would have gotten out there, but a lot of information would have gotten out that, that we don't have now. So when I wrote the book, I try to keep in mind that as we move forward, um, you're, you're going to be speaking to generations who didn't experience it and don't understand that we didn't have those kinds of communications, and, and therefore it will seem primitive to them the way some of the reactions happened. Again, it, it, it all would have been so different. So that you kind of have to straddle that in, in the book, not so that someone who's 50 will say, of course we didn't. But, you know, you, you're, you know we, the, the bus uh, groups of middle school students that we get every spring out of the memorial, I mean, they, they just they don't remember it. So their, their view of it, your view of the Kennedy assassination is different whether you were alive or not. I, I was very young. I remember it. I know it's different than most people younger than me. Um, I have a different view of World War II than my parents did because I wasn't alive. If you weren't alive, it, it's, it's just different. So part of this is also telling the story to a generation that doesn't remember exactly where they were that day. What do you remember about September 11th? I, uh, I walked into the office. The first plane crashed at, uh, at 8.46, hit the first tower. So I must have been a little late for work that day. I can admit that now, retroactive. But I, I walked in, so it must have been about 10 uh, to 9, and the receptionist just pointed to the conference room. She said, go in there. Who were you working for at the time? Penguin. I was working for the Penguins. Sorry. Uh, at uh, uh, one ch two Chenham Center here in Pittsburgh. And uh, I walked into the conference room, and there were six or seven people watching, and, the, you know, there's this smoking hole in a building, and you're... What's this? And this report then was a, a plane uh, probably got sidetracked and got lost or some pilot error crashed into a building mistake. No one thought terrorism. Um, and then you sat there and watched as the second plane hit, hit the building. And I think it's tough looking back because we have the clarity of hindsight. I do think that I thought it was a replay. It happened so fast. You're just not thinking that it, it, it could have been a second flight. Um, and the bewilderment of that, and I've got to do this book. I went back, and uh, the advantages of YouTube, you can go back and watch all the network news coverage that morning and how truly rattled these veteran news anchors were as that was unfolding on the air. They said some things, I'm sure, that just embarrassed them because it's, they, it sounds silly now knowing what we know, but just to try to figure out what was going on at, at that point. I think it's easy now to say, oh, I knew it was, it was definitely terrorism. I, I knew that. I'm, I'm not sure uh, it was so bewildering right in that moment. To me, the moment that got me was when, the, when I heard the news of the Pentagon crash, though. For some reason, I, I, was, I was bewildered by what was happening in New York. Again, this is still all in the moments of that morning. And those planes hit at 846 and 903. Then at 937, the plane hits the Pentagon. So it was probably five minutes later we got those reports. But that's when it hit me. I said, the, the Pentagon got it. I just thought... How could any plane ever approach the Pentagon? I thought there was anti, would be anti-aircraft guns and they would shoot it down. I mean, how much of a fortress, could, more of a fortress could there be than, than the Pentagon? So that's when I really knew that this was a, this was a moment that was going to change the world. Yeah, you say in here that officials from the Northeast Air Defense Sector weren't even notified that the plane had been hijacked until four minutes after it was already down. 
An order by Vice President Cheney to shoot down unresponsive aircraft threatening Washington wasn't issued from the White House until at least 1010, I guess after the yeah, Pentagon after the, plane. So yeah, and Flight 93, uh, 3 crashed at 1003. So it was, it was, it's, it's all in context there. Yeah, I mean, and it, this gets into all the conspiracy theories and was it shot down and what do we, and I think just looking back, the answer is, is no. Uh, uh, there is absolutely no evidence uh, anywhere that's come out 15 years that, 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 that that happened. But I think we have to remember, you have to look at it very, sometimes you just have to look at these things. You have to look at the evidence. You also have to look from a human standpoint. This had never happened before. They didn't anticipate it, and it all happened so fast. If we accept that at the very moment that the second plane hit the tower in, in New York, that that was when we knew it was terrorism, I still think it took us a little while. Maybe the, maybe the CIA folks in, in D.C. knew it, but 903. Flight 93 crashes at 10.03. That's an hour. That's an hour. Now it's easy to go back. Well, they should have been. Their communication systems were never set up for something like this. They never, no one ever imagined that, that we didn't have a defense system for somebody hijacking a commercial airliner, taking it over and flying it into a building. Um, the other thing is there were 4,500 planes in the air at that point. And, and uh, the, the FAA, very smartly, uh, shortly after 9.30, ordered them all to land. So they were all going to different airports. They were all going, in many ways, the wrong direction. One of the real miracles uh, of September 11th is that all those planes landed safely. The air traffic controllers just did a her Herculean job to get that many planes on the ground. It had never happened before. It never shut down American airspace. But so I say to people, sometimes when they're skeptics, say, okay, so which of the 4,500 4, planes going to the wrong airport are you going to shoot down? It wasn't that there was one plane in the sky. You knew that's what it was. But if, if you look at the tapes, and all the tapes are available, and the transcripts are available from uh, the FAA and from, uh, from the ads um, and, and, and NORAD, they were really bewildered, and their communication systems weren't meant to interlock. By the time they figured out, they did finally figure it out, but by the time that happened, it was too late. But you also have to have you, 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 the idea of shooting a passenger plane out of the sky. Well, now looking back, no, yes, oh, yeah, you should have done it. But the, to give that order, and, and the president and the vice president did discuss it, and the order was, in fact, given. But it wasn't given until after... Uh, all three, all four planes had crashed. The first three planes in, in, in Flight 93 that had crashed. Uh, was there a time when the the FAA just didn't know where some of the planes were? Yes. I mean, they knew they they used to know where they are, but just, there, just well, don't there were have multiple. Any idea. Imagine how many frantic reports were coming in, and there were reports of 11 or 12 hijacks. Even a few days after, there were questions: Were other planes targeted? Uh, well, again, in that hour while all this is going on, and nobody's in the same room, nobody's expected this. This wasn't that, that kind of day to, to sort through it. Um, they, uh, they, they and the military both were, 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 very, were very bewildered. But again, you just have to think about shooting down, shooting that. And the other thing is, is you know, with the Bin Laden raid, nobody's more secretive than the, than the Navy SEALs. Um, and there was a book right away, and there's a second book, and everybody, they're talking about everything, which is it's what happens in our society. Uh, nobody's ever written anything about this either. There's, 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 there's no evidence of it, but, but you look, at, you look at, at what must have been going through the officials' minds, the NIAs and the FAA officials, just wondering what was going on. And if you read some of the transcripts, you hear their comments. I mean, they, they, they're, they're trying to grasp what is happening. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a movie called United 93, which I think did a, it, it's, it's just on the flight, but it, it, I think it does a really good depiction. Um, having done all this research, I think they did, they did an excellent job. And there, uh, there is, an, I think, an excellent depiction of what, what happened at, at NIADS and how they were reacting to these reports and watching. On, and I, I think there was also, just from reading what they said and reading interviews, uh, a, a guilt on their part that this was happening on their, how is this happening? We, you know, uh, I, I think the, the greater fear that morning was are there more planes? Because after Flight 93 went down at 10:03, at we didn't know if that was it. We didn't know if there were more. There were going to be more crashes, and I think there probably was the expectation that there were going to be more crashes. Is that system any better now of knowing where planes are? What, what they're I, up to? From from what I've looked at, yeah, I always try to tell people that that the scope of my work here was on what what happened that day and 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 then aftermath, but certainly. They, they, they have had to have made those, 
those communications changes, and and uh, now you're we're aware that it could happen. You know the uh, two of the uh, F-16s that were that were finally scrambled went the wrong way. Went out there. They first went out over the ocean because that had been their training for all these years. Because it was the Soviet threat. We never anticipated a threat from a from our own commercial airliner, um, even if it had it been hijacked. Um, to have this happen, and, and I say never. I'm sure there were some very far, smart people within the CIA, within the intelligence community, who think of all sorts of possible things, but nothing that anybody thought was plausible that actually would happen, and uh, and that would be would be reacted, and that you would put defense mechanisms in place to prevent that. But just think if you if you make that proposal uh, on, on September 9th. You know, we're going to spend all this money to put in a system just in case somebody ever hijacks a commercial plane and tries to fly it in the building. No one would have believed that the, the citizens and the taxpayers would have gone, would have gone crazy. You, you do have to remember that. Uh, I think there's, there's certainly uh, criticism uh, that, is, that is deserved for, for people who are in power, but I also you have to, th to think practicality, what wasn't known and what couldn't have been done back then. You have to look at it from, from both views. Uh, the the door between the cabin where the pilots were and the, where the passengers were was not locked. It there was it could be locked. Certainly could be locked. We don't really know, uh, and we'll never know how they gained entrance. There are a couple of theories. Uh, one is they waited until meals were served. One is they waited until the door opened. Is for the casing flights. You know, sometimes I've been on flights and pilot opens the door. You know, you come. Um, but more likely was they. Uh, attacked one of the flight attendants who would have had the key or or the knock that would that would get them in and and that he she or he uh, under threat of you know with a, with a knife to their throat would have opened the door it's 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 one of the I, I, I talk in the book about everlasting mysteries there are things that can never be untangled we we can never know that uh, I, I think you know if anything uh, comes out and if the guys in, in the plotters in Guantanamo ever go on trial well, I guess we may f find some other facts about a plot but they don't know what happened on board the planes either they just know what was supposed to happen so, um, so we, we you know we can't know that but that seems the most plausible that they attacked the flight attendants and, and, and somehow that way gained interest in the cockpit, but it worked on all four flights. How much do you know that, that took place on the plane? Uh, it was a flight, first of all, from Newark to San Francisco? Yes, yes. Uh, and, and a couple of things on, on, on this plane uh, that, that made it different. And there are certainly parts of the story. Uh, the, the first sign of the book is Flight 93 was late. That is a big part of this story. If it had taken off even close to be on time, uh, I think there's very good a chance it would have hit its target because the people on board wouldn't have had the time. Um, it was supposed to take off at, at 8 o'clock. It backed off from the gate at 8.01. We've all flown. You never take off exactly the right time. But uh, it did not take off till 8.42. It sat there for three quarters of an hour. The other flights all took off relatively close to the when, when they were supposed to take off. The, the, uh, the Al-Qaeda plot was uh, they, they selected four planes that were scheduled to take off 25 minutes apart so that it would happen so quickly that no one could react. And the others all did in sequence. Um, Flight 93 did not because of that delay, Newark, it was just Newark airport traffic. They didn't factor in. The one thing they couldn't factor in was Newark airport traffic. So it, so it took off. And, and, and think of this, just as they made their turn over New York and started heading west, that was at 844. At 846, the first plane hit. Imagine, would, would history have been different had they seen that? Might have been, might not have been. I, I, I don't know. Um, but it, it was that close to, to even seeing that. Then the, the plan was they were supposed to, the hijackers were supposed to take over the planes within 15 minutes uh, of takeoff. That might have been unrealistic. It only happened on one of the planes, but the other three all did it within 30 minutes. Flight 93 took 46. So it it, there was a, a delay in taking off and a delay in their minds in taking over. That created an opportunity of time for the passenger and crew of Flight 93 that the other flights didn't have. When I speak about this, I try to emphasize that the, you can't say the passengers and crew on the other three flights were any less brave. They just didn't know what was happening. These, because that delay happened, when the passengers and crew of Flight 93 started making their calls on airphones, their loved ones on the ground were aware of what was going on. So they were calling to try to let their loved ones know th that they were in distress. What the unintended consequence was that they got information from their loved ones about what was going on. 
and through that they were able to formulate what was going on. Beyond that, um, we do have the cockpit voice recorder, which is chaotic. Uh, with, with that transcript, and then just uh, you know the, the testimony, for lack of a better word, of the people on the ground who got phone calls, and what their loved ones told them, and some of those have, ri have written books, and obviously those things weren't recorded, but uh, I, I tried to use a as many of the interviews as close to the time as I could. I know from my Civil War uh, study that uh, 20, 30 years later, stories change a little bit as you see how uh, you or your loved one is being viewed by history. So I think it's closer to the contemporary time are better, but, but you know, that's what we have. The other thing that happened was the, uh, in addition to the FBI uh, study of the phone calls, is the National Transportation Safety Board, because they recovered the, both black boxes on this flight, it was the only one where that happened because it didn't hit a building, it hit the ground. So the flight data recorder was discovered, and they were able to put together an animation of the entire flight path from the time the plane took off till the time it crashed. Uh, altitude, speed, direction, so you can see exactly the moment when, when the plane was hijacked. You can see when it turned around near Cleveland. You can see the hijacker pilot, Zia Jara, during the, the passenger and crew uprising, rocking the wings to try to knock them off balance. And, and, and all the chaos, you, could, you can, as the plane's flipping, you can just sense that chaos was happening at, at, at that point. And imagine how, not only with everything else you're going on, but you have a pilot at, at the controls who doesn't know what he's doing. And, and, and they certainly must have sent, sensed that as well. How many passengers on the plane? 33 regular passengers, 37 counting the hijackers. So 33 regular passengers. So it's not a full flight. And, no, and seven crew members. No, and it was, it was the lightest of, uh, of the planes that day. Uh, again, we do cut these questions from young people about that. Uh, today, those planes wouldn't take off. Back then, we were just moving planes. You, I traveled on planes often that were, that were really undersold. They just were moving the planes around the country. So that wasn't a consideration back then. Um, but uh, another part of their research is the hijackers figured out that Tuesday morning was a relatively light business travel morning. So they tried to pick a day, just to guess, uh, that, that there would be fewer people to resist. And as it, as it turned out, Flight 93 had the, had, the, had the fewest number of people on board. You know, 33. So we, we talk about 40 heroes. That's the 33 regular passengers and the seven crew. But with the hijackers, there were 44 people on board. Do you know how many actually in, were involved in trying to take back the plane? You, again, you can never know for sure. Um, and the, one of the things, the, the phone calls are very helpful. Um, 13 people made calls. That means 27 didn't. So as in my study of the Civil War with the soldiers in Pickett's Charge who died in Pickett's Charge, one of those might have the absolute clue to give us something else, uh, a greater understanding of what happened. It died on the battlefield. Um, all of these people uh, died in, in, in the crash, and 27 of them, we never heard their story. So we, we really can't know. Uh, we do know that some of the, you know, we, we know some of the attackers, uh, three, of the, three of the men uh, who, who called uh, people on the ground talked about the attack. We're gonna, so we were, you know, Todd Beamer and Todd Burnett and Jeremy Glick, uh, that they, they talked about we're gonna, in, in some form, we're gonna try to take back the plane. Uh, I believe there were six or seven or eight, you know, some of this, Brian, you have to, you, you look into this, you look into personalities, you look into, who was, you know, there was a, there's a guy named Joey Naki who didn't call. He was 5'9", 200 pound weightlifter, gregarious kind of guy. Uh, didn't take any guff. He was just one of uh, his, his, his brother's a Baltimore, a Baltimore County policeman. He just, you know, he didn't call, and, and so his family doesn't know, but he just strikes you with looking at his life. He's not the kind of guy who would sit there and say, yeah, you guys go ahead and rush the cockpit. I'm gonna sit here, you, you let me know what happens when you come back. So there's some of the, I think, uh, uh, we'll never know. I'm not sure that everybody on that plane didn't move forward in some way, uh, but it's, uh, you know, it's a narrow aisle. When I fly in 757s and I sit in the back, I sometimes sit there and I try to, right, out, right as I was writing this book, I, I took a flight to, uh, to London and I sat there and, and I was in the row where Tom Beamer w made his call. And, and I thought, wow, and I looked at that. I tried to imagine doing that uh, in that narrow aisle. So they were going down that aisle single file. And uh, so we can only from, uh, with the phone calls, they talked about what they were going to do in some way. Once the attack started, we, uh, we don't know. You can only kind of piece it together and, and do the best you can as, as historians do. But 
part of the fascination of history is the mystery of history. You know, some of this, some of this stuff we, we can't do. The frustrating thing is we can't. You know, in the Civil War, even now, somebody goes up in their attic tonight and finds in the bottom of a box a letter from a soldier that solves one more mystery. Um, that's not going to happen here because all the, all, the, all the soldiers, so to speak, died in the battlefield. You're involved with the Gettysburg Foundation? I'm on the marketing committee at the Gettysburg Foundation, yes. And also the Heinz History Center? Yes, I'm working over here. So, yeah, so his, history's my, uh, I always tell people that uh, uh, sports for most people is their escape from the real life. That's what they do away from their job. And, and I say, as much as I love sports and I love my job, I need an escape from sports. I, I can't go home every night after working on sports for eight or ten hours and, and watch a game all the time. So history is my sports. That, that's what I do to get away. Uh, uh, the first weekend after every Penguin season, I go to Gettysburg. That's, that's just, just kind of always been. That's, that, that's how I, 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 I chill. I, and I calm down. So. Before this interview, you said that you can be seen in the background of many of the PC and Gettysburg <laughs> yeah. tours. I, I, I did tell you that I've been a, I've been a bit actor on many. Uh, <laughs> this is not my first appearance on PC and not my first interview because I, I, uh, I go. I've been going to the anniversary days up there for 20 years. And, uh, and uh, go on all those battle walks that, that PCN shows. And, uh, and I, as you show the old ones, I can see, before I was smart enough to stand behind the camera so I couldn't be seen, I can see the steady regression of my hairline. Uh, but it's, a, it's uh, as, as, as I mentioned, it's a great service that, uh, that PCN does with that. So, so it's, it's good to be on in official capacity, but I have been on before. Now, uh, taking our focus to uh, Shanksville, Pennsylvania, uh, were there eyewitnesses who actually saw the plane go down? There was... There was one person, probably only one person who, who actually saw it impact, there was a man that it came over a hill, and there was a scrap uh, yard on that hill. And there was a man on his second day at work uh, who, who was out and saw the plane come over his head um, and obviously felt the crash. Um, there were, I don't want to say dozens, but maybe dozens, certainly a number of people who saw the plane in its final moments. Um, uh, who's, who described to reporters at the time the, the September 12th news reports of the wings being rocked. So people saw it flying and intact in its final moment and how bewildered, um, bewildered they were. But again, remember, it was going, uh, the NTSB founded it by, with the flight data recorder, it was going 563 miles an hour. You saw it for an instant. If you saw it, you saw it for an instant. Uh, I, I dealt with and, and read oral history some more people who felt it. The people out there felt it. Imagine a plane of that size hitting the ground at that speed. It felt just a shock. And, it, and, uh, and, and some saw the fireball, which was very brief because, it, again, it didn't hit a building. It, it was a fireball that went up in the air, and, and there was not much to burn. It's one of the reasons the FBI knew from the start that this would be the site where they were able to glean the most evidence because it didn't hit a building. It went into the ground. Um, and, and because the fire burn, burned for only a short period of time. So uh, what they've concluded is, is that it hit at a 40-degree angle, and the, about the front third of the plane snapped and, and shattered and flew into a grove of, of hemlock trees. And a lot of the evidence, especially from the hijackers, was found there. It was all fragmented. But some of it was intact. Uh, there was, a, there was a, a man named Richard Guadana who worked for a, a, a wildlife uh, complex in, in, in California, and his credentials were found intact. Um, this is the, these are the items that, that flew forward that, that weren't burned. Uh, the back two-thirds of the plane went into the ground, and it crashed right on the site of a reclaimed strip mine. And, and it, the dirt had been taken out for years. They mined the coal, and then they put it back. In the mid-'90s, they put it back in. So it wasn't as consolidated as normal dirt. If you walked on it, it felt, it, it felt solid, obviously. But the plane hit there. Uh, it's one of the reasons they found items of the plane 35 feet under the ground. They dug 40 feet. Uh, the, the, the two black boxes were found 15 feet and 25 feet underground. That just tells you the violence of the crash. So a lot of those things were, were preserved. The biggest piece of the plane they found over was about the size of the hood of a car. It was a piece of the fuselage. Um, they have bits and pieces, that's all. We only have a few minutes left. I want to ask you, can you tell about some of the uh, design problems they had with the memorial and, and some of the conspiracy yeah. theorists, theories uh, about it? The families, they had a battle every step of the way. It, it, it was amazing. Um, you know, this was the one, I think, that most Americans would say, this is the one. This should have been the easiest memorial to build. 
just because of the fact that you had Americans fighting back. Remember how, how I felt and how we felt that day, probably September 13th, when we first heard about this, because this news wasn't available on the first day. What had happened with the Todd Beamer call, what was going on. Um, but it was, one of the things that happened is a lot of people from New York died in the, who lived in New York died in the Twin Towers. A lot of people who were from or lived in, the, in D.C. died in the Pentagon. No one from near Somerset County. Not in, in, in this flight. So you had families from all over the country, the world, trying to come together, uh, and 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 there were always going to be skeptics. And they had a design competition, and there were a thousand entries, and, and uh, they they picked the design, and immediately there were uh, blogs that said it was a tribute to Islam, and and this, uh, those. One of things, the names for it was the something crescent. Uh, yes, it was. Uh, it, he, he used the word crescent. Um, which they viewed as a, as a sign of Islam. I think it was, it was just, he viewed it, if you're out there, you can see there's kind of a circle. Uh, there, there's a bowl. If we would call it the bowl, it worked, there, there's a bowl where, that puts down to where the plane crashed. And, and the architect saw that that was the focal point. He wanted to make it very much a landscape memorial. Some of these people do come out and they kind of say, where's the monument? And he wanted it to be the rural field in Somerset County where the plane crashed. Uh, you know, and, and they, they got a lot of it looking the way it did on September 10th. Um, and I think that's part of the magic of it, but it's an unusual memorial that way. But there were, you know, there was a hue and cry, and, and the families had to go through that battle. But finally, uh, the, the, the other thing that happened were there were eight landowners of the land out there. It was privately owned land. Two of them companies and, and six individuals. So there was a battle to, to buy that land. It, 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 it took... It took a long time, and it's, it's why they didn't get the memorial opened until the 10th year, but they were determined to get something for the families in the 10th year. And I can tell you, I was out there uh, long before I had the idea for the book on the dedication ceremony, and uh, former presidents George W. Bush and Bill Clinton were on stage. And I don't care what your politics are. If you're a place where you see two former presidents sitting on stage, uh, you know, something very powerful happened there. So that, uh, that, that's a memory that will always stick with me, seeing the, the, those two men there who both were, who both were affected by al-Qaeda, certainly. Are you involved with the Flight 93 Memorial yeah, I'm now? Uh, I, uh, I'm, uh, they've asked me to be a member of their board, so I'm on the board of the, of the Friends of Flight 93. It's a citizens group that supports the memorial, supports the Park Service. So it's just citizens from around the country who volunteer their time. Uh, so I'm part of that, and uh, I, I volunteer out there as an ambassador and a greeter, especially in the summer months, just to help tell the story as, uh, as visitors come. And again, with the opening of the Visitor Center in 2015, there's a lot more to, uh, to show people. It's, it, it's a... It's, we, we, did, we were missing the educational piece of it, and now we have it out there. So I always tell people, if you, if you went out there in the first uh, 10 or 11 or 12 years, you haven't really visited the memorial yet. It's, it's, it's quite a special place. So what was the experience like writing this book as a serious non-sports book? It was, uh, it, it was one of the most incredible experiences of my life. I mean, I, sometimes I, it, it, it's hard to believe uh, uh, it happened. I remember, I read the book and I remember agonizing over this word or, or going back. You know, I, 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 the one thing that surprised me as a, as a one who wrote sports and wrote for newspapers and has written all my life, you're usually not, you're your own worst critic, which I was in this book, I think, but, but you're usually not satisfied with what you write. Go back. I, 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 this, is, this one's different. I, I read, when I turned it in finally, I said, this is the book I wanted to write. Uh, that, that was an unusual feeling. Um, I, it's, it's exactly the book I wanted to write. So, I, and, and, and I know it's, it's, I hope there are more. There, there, sh, there should have been more books written already. I hope it inspires someone, maybe it won't be for 10 or 20 years, to, to look at it from a different perspective. We're still writing books on Gettysburg 160 years later almost. Um, so I think September 11th, uh, th there needs to be more of that. But um, it, w it was quite a special experience. This is the cover of the book we've been talking about, Flight 93, The Story, the Aftermath, and the Legacy of American Courage on 9-11. Tom McMillan, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Appreciate it. You've been listening to a podcast of PA Books, a production of PCN, the Pennsylvania Cable Network. We'd like to hear from you. Our email address is pabooks at pcntv.com. Like us on Facebook to learn more about PA Books.